If you're like me, first of all, that's too bad. Second, you know that Gerard 401 or 301 or even 201 are magical terms in audiophilia. Why? Because it's this. This is, for many people, can, the holy grail of turntables are considered one of the greatest ever made. Uh, it's the successor, the 401 is, to the Gerard 301, which was a successor to the 201. I won't go into a huge history lesson, but the 201 started out just to play 78s for the BBC right around World War II. I believe eventually they added in 33 speed as well to that. Then they designed a whole new unit for the BBC from the ground up. That was the 301, and there's all sorts of concern about grease bearing versus oil bearing and the color and that sort of thing. And then the 401 uh, came out. That was the last iteration in the mid-60s, and I believe these lasted through 1976. Uh, and this one, there's people who argue the merits for or against a 401 versus a 301. I like my 401 just fine, and these can usually be had pretty nicely for well under $2,000, whereas 301s probably start in the uh, right around $1,800 for a decent one. Now you'll notice, see this? There's this unit, and then there's a wood base. See that? No? Yeah. Because this is mounted in it. Technically, the turntable is just this piece that's got the uh, the chocolate brown or olive green, whatever you want to call it, base. Uh, it didn't come with the arm, technically. Uh, it also didn't come with a base, technically, and you had to buy those things separately and get them mounted properly so that they would all work together in harmony. And there's all sorts of schools of thought about what kind of base to have. If you want it to be, like this is granite, just happens to be this countertop. If you want it to be an all granite countertop type thing that's real thick that you mount it in, or slabs of wood, this is a not totally hollow, but uh, not completely braced inside base. And this was one of the ones that they offered originally back in the day in the 60s and 70s uh, that you could get from the factory with a Gerard 401 and the very popular SME 3009 tone arm that was often paired up with it. Uh, I'll get to the cartridge in a second right there. But uh, this was how it was put together. And so just for this, the motor unit, as, as it's called in Great Britain, uh, a lot of times you're looking at a thousand bucks just for one of those, a Gerard 401 that works uh, in, in good condition. So this one, I'm not going to take it apart too much or pop this off, but I will just show you, uh, and this was used technically for uh, radio stations, BBC stations is who it was kind of designed for originally. Uh, it's got a pitch control. It's got an on-off, obviously made in England. It's got the three speeds that were used back then. If you've ever seen a turntable, it's got 16 speed, which 16 and two thirds really, which is half of 33 and a third. Uh, that 16 speed was usually for children's records or uh, material for the blind that was spoken word, so they could fit a lot of it onto one disc. Uh, I've heard tell of discs that were 16 RPM for radio broadcast of radio shows, but I think that people are confusing those with 16 inch discs. Those are called transcription discs that ran at 33 that could fit a whole half hour radio show on one side, which was how a lot of shows were distributed, uh, especially in the U.S back before tape and then of course before satellites and everything. So as you can see, mine's spinning pretty happily. It's got the strobes and I don't know if you can tell, it's not quite dead on. So I'm gonna adjust it a little bit. There we go. Still a hair of uh, wavering. I guess that would be wow in this. Because these old motors, I just switched this on. They need a little bit of time to warm up and run at constant speed. I mean, this thing after all is at least probably 50 years old. And the mat that came with these, I've got the mat somewhere, the original mat that came with this, and it had ridges and it was made of plastic, and it's not a bad mat. There's, of course, many others that you can get that are nicer. Now, cork, that sort of thing, all sorts of mats, sometimes can run to the hundreds of dollars. Uh, but the one I had had just gone brittle, so I put it away. I may have even tossed it out, but I'm not positive. And this, hear that ringing? We don't like that. So that's why we put this on. To dampen it. This is actually, all right, don't tell anyone, this is embarrassing. That's what this really is. I got this with one of those LP120s, which are also not bad turntables. I'll do a video on those at some point, but this one, I use it for that, and it's actually worked out quite good. Now, when I first got this unit, there was a couple things when I pulled it out of mothballs that were not making it happy. This was wavering a lot more. I popped this off and just cleaned the interior rim of this because it's being driven by an idler wheel, a rubber wheel on the inside of this. That made all the difference. Uh, as far as the speed, it made it a lot better about what it is now. Uh, this 
inside of here, you can't see it of course, but down there, there's a connector that goes at the bottom of this, and then coming out the back are the RCA cables. That had simply just fallen out. So you plugged it in, you got no sound whatsoever. I popped the bottom off, pushed that plug back into place, bing, bang, boom, I was in business. The other thing, you can see there are so many adjustments on this thing. It's like a dental apparatus, and the height was way off. So I would be playing a record, I would get to about here, you know, maybe the last track, and this piece here would be scraping on this because it was at an angle, horrendous. And I didn't understand, I thought it was a bad needle, I didn't know what was happening, so it took me a while to realize, oh, you can adjust the height and it's not correct right now, and so you should adjust it. So I did. Uh, this is not factory, this is just here and whatnot, and I forget which, that goes to a different cartridge. So, getting to the cartridge, this Gerard 401 with an SME 3009 arm, the classic combo is to have those with a Shure V15 cartridge. Now, the V15 went through about, I'm going to say, four iterations through the late 70s, and then there was a fifth one, and then there was a variation on that, and then they discontinued it, and then they brought it back in the late 90s for, I guess, what would amount to a seventh iteration. But those, were all, those last three were all numbered five, and then some sort of nomenclature after that. So looking through all the generations, pretty much every time I've had a Shure V15 uh, 5 of any kind, something has gone wrong with getting a replacement stylus. So that's what I had on this originally. It sounded good, but it was just getting expensive and ridiculous to find a replacement. Uh, the models 2, 3, and 4 are considered quite good, especially the 3 and the 4. Uh, the Model 1, I've not heard too many people talk about it. It would be 15 Model 1. Uh, that's from, I'd say, the early 60s, so I don't know hi-fi-wise how that would go. But a 2, 3, and 4, you can still find even new old stock replacement style pretty uh, reasonably. Uh, or you can find new ones still being made. Sometimes you'll find new old stock or even some company like Jiko, Jiko out of Japan or SAS making them uh, for the fives, but they've just proven elusive and expensive for me increasingly. So I got rid of that and I was turned on to this cartridge. It's an Audio-Technica. It's an AT440 MLB and I guess it sounds better than the MLA is what people tell me. I'm very happy with it. Uh, only thing that was weird was these mounting screws that came with it. Look how much they stick out. I don't get that. but. Uh, this Technics head shell that I had around, I just put it in that, popped it on here, and the whole combo sounds very nice. I like it. And one thing that surprised me, regardless of the speed, there's very low rumble. A lot of people, especially with a 301, have said that rumble becomes a problem. And I think that might be partially because the 301 was originally designed for uh, radio stations when mono was in, so they didn't consider that there was going to be information both up and down and left and right in the groove, which is what we have for stereo. So the rumble wasn't a big deal. You weren't able to hear as much. When they put stereo arms on them and they were in older, more hollow bases, then people really heard rumble. These, it's not been as much of a problem. And this, it's next to nothing. I've been very happy with it. I do have a typewriter mat underneath, so that's something. Uh, but even at 78, I don't get rumble. And I will say that I have a certain, not to be named, direct drive late 70s audiophile turntable with 78 speed that does have rumble. So uh, this thing, even though it's 50 some years old and the design probably goes back further than that, it sounds great and it's pretty robust and as you can see the speed has pretty much zeroed in to one spot. Oh, it did drift a little and make me look silly. But that's my Gerard 401. Oh, and it came with the dust cover, which I'm about to bring up here. There's the dust cover. And again, I believe this whole unit was a Gerard. You can get this from Gerard dealers in the US. Keep in mind, there's a lot of these in Great Britain. If you bring them over here to the United States, there's all sorts of things that you may have to do to get the voltage and the uh, frequency of the voltage to or the current to match. Um, it's not a huge endeavor, but you will have to do more to do. Whereas this, it was here and it was already ready to go for me to turn into what I believe is probably the last turntable I will ever buy.